I know all of you on this subcommittee have heard about the driver shortage. I have too, pretty much my entire career in trucking. Guess what? They ain't one. Simple math tells the story. When the number you hear is 50,000 or some other number for the shortage, states issue over 400,000 new CDLs every year, every year. What is incorrectly labeled as shortage is actually turnover, attrition. People attracted to truck trucking with the hopes of doing better for themselves and their family are quickly met with unkept promises and say goodbye to trucking. I really can't think of a worse response to the myth of a driver shortage than to lower the driving age or reduce the already low standards to get a CDL. This really is a highway safety issue. What's not a myth is that new drivers crash more often and younger drivers crash more often. There is no substitute for experience when it comes to safety and doing things that help perpetuate the churn or driver turnover is not only counterproductive to safety, but it undermines the economics for all drivers. I'm not a, we, our organization is not a proponent of lowering the permissible driving age for commercial drivers below 21. And you know, everything about this committee is about safety. When we look at the numbers of crashes, uh, of where crashes take place and the drivers, you don't take that age down, you take it up. You take it up to at least 25, which is largely what it was back in the 70s when I entered trucking. Yeah. This is just a copy of the regulations that all drivers are required to comply with. Uh, they're trained on virtually none, but they're there because they can be held responsible even when they have no, even when they should have no responsibility. Uh, it is a monstrous problem that that has actually cost our cost trucking specifically as much as three billion a year in society over five. But the way it plays out is it means driver work weeks are always going to be 70 to 80 hours and sometimes longer. Now they're not always working all of those hours, but their time is being controlled by others. And, and the biggest uh, the biggest bandits on that deal are going to be shippers and receivers. And I should point out that these folks even now in some instances have the gall to actually charge drivers for late deliveries. Uh, many of the regulations that are on the books today hold drivers accountable for everything that could possibly go wrong, but none of those really address the, the, the frustrations and the lost time that drivers will spend in shipping and receiving facilities. Again, we're talking about anywhere from 10 to as much as 45 hours a week, every week. That puts the work week for a truck driver at 80, sometimes more hours per week. When somebody's considering an occupation, a career, uh, do they take one that involves, that works 40 or 45 hours a week where you're home, or one that's 80 hours or more and you're away from home and you don't make more money? Uh, I don't think that's a real, I don't think that's a real tough decision. People are gonna make the decision that works best for them and who can blame them. You mentioned, you mentioned spe sleep apnea specifically and I know some are focused on that as the big bugaboo now, but it doesn't cause drivers to crash trucks. And what happened when we had increased focus, increased enforcement, and this was all economically, economically driven, we, set up, we put a lot of those guys out of trucking. And as a result, we believe that is a contributor to fatalities on the road going up. But looking at the crash data, I would take considerable issue with those that claim that sleep apnea is causing crashes. Because all, all sleep apnea is, is something that causes you not to get the quality of sleep that you may need. Whether or not you crash a vehicle, whether it's a car or a truck, has to do with driving when you're sleepy, driving when you're drowsy, something that no driver should do. Speed limited trucks, whether they're speed limited through technology or through artificially low speed limits, simply serve as impediments, barriers to other people trying to drive down the road. And I think it's really, really interesting too that we have proponents for making uh, tougher rear-end underwrite equipment on trailers 
when we have policies that actually have the net effect of causing more trucks, more cars to rear end trucks. I think it's somewhat ironic that we do that. I drove, when I, when I drove, I drove when I felt like driving. I drove to accommodate weather, I drove to accommodate shippers and receivers, and it wasn't always in blocks of 10 or 11 or 14. Again, what ELDs have done has created the stress level for drivers, but one of the, but what they've pointed out is the problems that we have with existing hours of service regulations. We recognize the potential for automated systems to tremendously improve highway safety, uh, the potential, but we struggle to separate reality from what are simply marketing claims. And I heard some statistics thrown out a while ago for a big carrier that reports marvelous results with the use of different technologies. Well, I've heard this stuff before, and I've had our fellows look at the safety data that gets reported to FMCSA, and we don't see any difference in real road safety. But you know, one of the key things, one of the key dilemmas that professional truck drivers have is that they don't have places to park to get off the road where they actually can get, it might be a break or it might be a long eight or 10 hour uh, restorative sleep. But I mean, that's the biggest challenge that virtually all in trucking deal with right now. And it's not a new challenge. Uh, we've, it's been an issue for 20 years. And we talk about infrastructure, we talk about safety, the environment that drivers and transportation are provided in has to come with some way for people to get off the road when they need it. So I hope that can be a focus, an ongoing focus going forward.